Welcome to the McCarthy Report, the podcast where I, Rich Lowry, discuss with Andy McCarthy the latest legal and national security issues. This week, what else? The Mar-a-Lago special master and the Bannon indictment. You are, of course, listening to a National Review podcast. If for some reason you're not already following us on a streaming service, you can find us everywhere from Spotify to iTunes. And please give this podcast and Andy McCarthy the glowing, indeed gushing, five-star reviews they deserve on iTunes now. Without further ado, I welcome to this very podcast through the miracle of Zoom, none other than Andy McCarthy. Rich, how are you? Good, Andy. How's it going? Uh, it's going fine. It's going better for uh, for us. Um, obviously, we're we're dealing with uh, Queen Elizabeth's passing, and I, I'm just I'm still taken aback by it because of the uh, I I looked at the newspaper on it seems to me like two or three days ago and she was meeting in her office with the new prime minister and my wife and i said gee she looks good you know for, for um and then probably less than two days later comes the news yeah. well she probably wasn't feeling great but knew she had to look good because that, that's part of the job and that's what she was about you know it for sure was five decades doing doing the the job and she she was literally an institution she was she was formed by and shaped by that institution and enlivened it fully lived lived out the role and let's hope charles is now old enough where he he can do uh at least attempt to do something similar yeah I, he worries me but you know we got to give him obviously have to give him a chance but I, you know it's so it's so stunning i heard this morning the first thing uh, I went out early this morning and I was tootling around the car. And the first thing I heard on the radio was somebody mentioned that unless you're in your 80s, Queen Elizabeth's the only queen mm -hmm. of England that anyone has ever known. I mean, usually you have these things where you, it comes up and says, you know, if you're not over 40, uh, this is something that will be mystifying to you. This is like almost everybody on the planet Earth. There's yeah. never been, uh, you know, for such a consequential historical figure, there's never been any other queen uh monarch british monarch than than queen elizabeth yeah. so it's just it's an amazing um you know we all knew it was coming and it had to come and all that stuff but it's just a it's a remarkable thing and she was a remarkable person so all right so on a grubbier note and that that will constitute the entirety of the rest of this uh podcast that that's our, our that was the elevated element of our, our programming so we have this special master ruling that you've delved into at length. You have J Judge Cannon saying we need a, a special master to filter through these these um, documents that were were seized. What's what's uh, going on here? And as is our custom, get, give us the, the the big broad take and then we'll dive in. Yeah, well, I'm starting to wonder about my uh, skills as a prognosticator, Rich, because I think when we talked about this on Friday, I had kind of talked myself into thinking that even though her uh, Judge Cannon's early indications were that um, she was inclined to grant to the special master, but she was careful to say she hadn't made up her mind yet. I really thought that once she saw the uh, the papers that were filed, uh, that she would not do it because the the strength of the government's position, even though I think she had reasons to be annoyed at some of the uh, uh, some of the things that the government did in the litigation, but they had the better of the argument. And then it turned out that she really did want to, um, you know, we, we speculated as we were discussing this last week that she might want to just, you know, throw Trump a bone to make it at least look like she was doing something in his favor, but otherwise um, so gut the idea of a special counsel or a special master that uh, it would be almost nominal. And it turned out, I don't think that's what happened at all. I mean, she she really gave him a special master, which is peculiar, I think, because as we as we noted last week, the uh, the Justice Department was already through their privilege review process uh, by the time she ruled on this, which is one of the things I thought that uh, would annoy her about the way the government had performed. It occurs to me as I'm saying this that I, before I try to give the ten thousand foot view, I should just like review with people what a special master is in these yeah. in this context, because otherwise they'll they'll not know what we're talking about. Um, 
in any situation, there are a variety of reasons why you would have a special master in complex litigation. But the most common one and the one that we're talking about here is any situation where the government seizes, uh, the government executes a search warrant in a place where there is apt to be lots and lots of privileged information. The, most, the common situation is the lawyer's office um, where the government has gotten a search warrant because they believe either the lawyer is involved in the crime or a client of the lawyer is involved in the crime and there'll be evidence on the on the premises. When you search a lawyer's office, especially, say, a busy defense lawyer, the amount of information that's actually going to be actually going to be relevant to the case that you're investigating versus all of the potentially privileged information in the lawyer's office is small. I mean, the amount that you're looking for is small. And the problem is that if the prosecutors who are investigating the case get access to attorney-client privileges, uh, privileged information that's relevant to the case, they then find out what the, the protected confidences are. It's a Sixth Amendment violation. It uh, exposes you to defense strategy in the case. And what the cases basically say is the prosecutors can be disqualified. It's also a doctrine of the law that um, if you build a case based on privileged information, this comes up in a variety of contexts, most, most usually the context where the government gives someone immunity from prosecution so that you could get their fifth that you you could force them to testify. They no longer have a Fifth Amendment privilege. If you try to turn around and prosecute somebody after that, um, what the cases basically hold is that even if you show the court that your decision to prosecute was based on the information you knew before you got the immunized testimony, they'll throw out the case because they figure the operation of your mind is affected by what you've heard as a prosecutor from. Uh, the defendant in the way of privileged information. So the Justice Department really um, does, I can attest to this personally, um, make really bends over backwards to try to avoid being um, exposed to privileged information, not because they're great guys and because they should do that uh, under the Constitution. We hope they are, but it, it's, it's really self-preservation because your case can get thrown out and you can get disqualified. So what happens in normal cases when the government this I shouldn't say normal because this is not the usual situation, but it's not so unusual that there's not a process for it. If the government has to do a search warrant for like that, it has an internal process where you have two or three lawyers, government lawyers who are not involved in the criminal investigation. And they do the first cut through everything that was seized, and they try to pick out anything that looks like it is privileged, uh, so that ultimately, when the law, when the prosecutors and the FBI agents in this case, who are investigating the case, finally get access to the evidence that was seized in the search, it doesn't contain any of the privileged information that would taint them as far as the prosecution's concerned. So that's the setup. And now what's the special master? Well, if it was your privileged information that was seized, you wouldn't want the government unilaterally to be making the decision about what the prosecutors were able to see and what they weren't. You're not gonna be comfortable with the Justice Department telling you, don't worry, we'll have another bunch of prosecutors go through this to decide what the other prosecutors get to see. So. What people will commonly ask for in this situation is a special master. That's a lawyer who's appointed by the court, usually in consultation with both parties. So what's what happens in most cases and what's happening in this case today, as a matter of fact, is the lawyers for both parties get together and they either agree on a person or they propose uh, like – two or three people each, and then the court decides who the special master will be. And the special master is an appointee of the court who's a neutral party and goes through all the privileged information to make sure that the defendant's privileged information is not getting 
uh, is being protected and is not getting to the uh, to the prosecutors on the case. So what Trump wanted here was a special master to go through all of the seizures from Mar-a-Lago rather than have the Justice Department internally determine what the trial prosecutors got to see. So that's what that's what this was. Uh, that's what this was all about in the first place. And uh, on the merits of her decision, you're a little doubtful. She She's saying that um, the uh, Trump may have an executive privilege claim here, or, or at least it's it's not as clear cut as the government says. Yeah. So, Rich, I, I think it's really clear cut. Um, and I think the judge really bent over backwards. Let's just start out with what executive privilege is. Mm -hmm. now, executive privilege is it, it, it's a privilege that's existed ever since we've had presidents under the Constitution, but it wasn't recognized by the courts really until the Watergate era. Uh, and in those cases, uh, famously, the, the one in 1974 involving the Watergate tapes, uh, President Nixon tried to assert executive privilege to prevent the special prosecutor from getting access to the tapes. And the Supreme Court in 1974 recognized that there has always been a privilege of the executive branch over the communications between the president and his top advisors. Because absent that, you wouldn't have efficient policymaking. If you had to worry, if everybody had to worry when they went in to have a meeting over a big decision that, you know, the next day uh, or, or the next uh, time something happened uh, that was controversial in Congress, the Congress would start subpoenaing everyone and your, your, uh, the frank advice that you tried to give the president would become public, then nobody would give their best advice to the president. So this whole idea is so the executive branch can govern efficiently, um, and it has been expanded over time to include not only communications between the president and his top advisors, but also uh, executive work po product that flows from that, including communications among subordinates in the executive branch to carry out the president's policy. So that's what executive privilege is. So you could see right away, I think, a problem here, which is why would a former president have executive privilege? Um, executive privilege is for the protection of the executive branch. It's not for the protection of an individual person who happens to be president. Uh, it's for the efficient conduct of executive business. It's not for uh, the personal potential liability, like the Fifth Amendment is. It's not for the personal potential liability of a uh, of a particular person who happened to hold the office at one point. So the proposition here is that Trump, as a former president, is saying that he has executive privilege because even though he's a former president, if you don't give confidentiality to his presidential communications – then all current presidents have to worry that when their former president, uh, that when their term is over, their communications and those of their uh, top aides will become public. And you, you then have the same problem, which is that once it becomes once you know it's going to become public, then, you know, people don't give their best advice to the president and the president can't uh, deliberate in a uh, in an honest way with his top advisors. So. The argument is that it's the same problem, even if you're a former president. Constitutionally speaking, uh, the the problem with that is there. And, and this, again, we've talked about this case a number of times, but this goes back to Justice Scalia's famous dissent, Morrison v. Olson, where he says in 1988 that in our system, the framers literally in the Constitution vested all executive power in one officer, the president of the United States. The only person in the government who has executive power, the only person in the world that has American executive power is the president. So you're talking about a former president who doesn't have any power. He's not even a, a government official. Mm -hmm. How could he have executive privilege? And then in this case, you have to take it the next step, which is Trump is saying, 
Not only do I have executive privilege, I can execute it against the executive branch in the interference of the executive branch's core responsibilities, which include investigating crime, especially crime that may affect national security, and tracking down intelligence, which is the, you know, essentially the property of the executive branch, which the president has always had uh, almost plenary control over the uh, the disposition of. So what, what Trump is saying is even though he's out of power, he not only can ex- assert executive privilege, he can assert it against the Biden administration's investigative agencies in a matter that may be a very serious matter as far as our national security is concerned. So I, I think that's a good reason to doubt all of this. Um, but it's not like Trump is pulling this out of the sky. There's a 1977 case, I think, that we've also talked about called Nixon against administrator. This is this post Watergate case written by Justice Brennan, which is not a model of of uh, linear thinking, I must say. Um, But basically what what Brennan says for the court out of one side of his mouth is that, oh, yes, former presidents must have executive privilege. Uh, because their communications have to be protected. Otherwise, the current president would have, you know, all the things we just said. And then at the other side of his mouth, he says, but it can be overcome uh, in an appropriate case if it's got to be balanced against an interest that overcomes it. And in that case, they said the interest that overcame it was the general service administration's need to have access to presidential information so it could archive it for government records purposes. So, If that need overcomes a former president's executive privilege to to the extent a former former president has it, how could it not be the case that whatever privilege there is would be overcome by executive agencies who are conducting a criminal investigation of the mishandling of classified information under circumstances where if they don't track down the classified information, we have to worry that methods and sources of intelligence have been compromised and the country may have a security problem. So it, it you know, it just seems to me that it's a, if, if the Nixon thing, if Nixon's privilege, which they recognized in that case, wasn't enough to overcome the General Services Administration, how on earth could Trump have a, a, a privilege that would overcome the Biden administration in this case? So a couple other problems as well. There's a question of whether this case is properly before Judge Cannon and whether she has jurisdiction. Also, Trump's standing. We don't need to get in detail in, into all of these, but very briefly, just just hit on the uh, uh, other problems this might have. Yeah, she said, you know, basically she says she is jurisdiction rich as an equitable court and a court of equity. You know, you're kind of weighing the the merits of each side. And when she decided to hop in on on Trump's behalf here, um, she, when she's weighing the relative merits of the case, what she leaves out is that, you know, this is supposed to be an emergency application if you really need a special master. And Trump waited two weeks to seek it. And then the judge waited another two weeks to rule. So by the time, you know, they got to it, this was already um, uh, it it, it was already the government had already been through its process. And then the other thing, uh, which I think is kind of I'll try to take these two together because it's both it goes to jurisdiction and uh, standing. What the judge relied on in saying that Trump had an interest here is that. Some of the stuff that was seized out of Mar-a-Lago was Trump's own personal property. And that's true, but it's beside the point. It would be it would be very relevant if what Trump was moving for was a return of property under the under the uh, normal rules of criminal procedure. But what Trump is asking here is for a special master to decide privilege issues and the the documents that are relevant to the privilege question are not Trump's personal documents. They're the government documents, and they're not Trump's documents at all. So on the one hand, um, they really don't cut in his favor in terms of equity. And on the other hand, with respect to standing, since they're not his documents, um, he doesn't really have a property interest uh, in what happens to them. 
So on, on both those scores, um, that really cut against Trump, and yet she relied on those factors as part of the reason to intervene here with a special master. So there was a decision DOJ had to make whether to appeal or not. They have appealed and have limited it just to what you ruled on the classified documents, trying to avoid you know, going to a, a, a potentially embarrassing appeal of the entire ruling for her and giving her an, an, an out just on what DOJ is most concerned about here. Also, some more, and this has been a theme here last uh, several weeks, so, some more worrisome indicators for Trump in this DOJ filing. Yeah, so the dilemma that the Justice Department had here, Rich, is I think they think they have a very strong legal position. I certainly think they have a very strong legal position. But, you know, appeals are time consuming. And on the other hand, they may not like the special master, but if they got if they got the appointment of a special master that they were comfortable with and that they believed would apply the law correctly, it would be infuriating for them to have to like delay for, say, three weeks while the special master went through everything they've already done and and said, yeah, they implemented their process correctly. But at least it would be three weeks and it would be over and then they'd be on with the investigation. Whereas if they appeal to the 11th Circuit, you know, all bets are off because you're not in control of the the 11th Circuit will be in control of the calendar, not the not the Justice Department. And everything could be frozen while the 11th Circuit deliberates over this. Still, you know, you can try to get an expedited appeal, but you can't force the Court of Appeals to do it. So they're in this dilemma where um they have a strong position where they can probably prevail in the appellate court, but it would take a long time. And in the meantime, you have this national security problem of unaccounted for uh, classified information, national defense secrets, or they could swallow hard and go along with a special master, hope to get through it and uh, be back on track as far as the investigation goes in a couple of weeks. So the way they've tried to thread this needle and we're talking on, uh, as is our custom, on uh, midday on Friday. Last night or late oh, yesterday. I saw that line from me, Andy. I did, yeah. Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> it's a good line. It's a good line. <laughs> um, so le yesterday late, they um, the Justice Department filed their motion. And I think what they did here is pretty clever, Rich. What they did was they said to the judge, look. We're not appealing yet, but we're thinking about it. And the most important thing to us is the classified information. So what we're doing is we're asking you to stay the parts of your order that told us that we can't use the classified information during our criminal investigation. And that would force us to give the classified information to a special master. And if you walk those back by next Thursday, uh, then we won't appeal. We'll just go oh, ahead with the. With, to my apologies for mischaracterizing it as an appeal. Well, no, they call it a they, they call their motion a motion uh, pending appeal. But the way they explain it is, we're we're now taking the first steps that we would have to take to appeal. Mm -hmm. But you can you can forfend this by, um, you know, doing the right thing here and realizing that he doesn't have a conceivable claim of executive privilege over classified documents. They're not his, they're not communications. We need them. And even if he had some uh, illusory or, or very dubious uh, uh, privilege to assert here, it would easily be overcome by the government's interest in conducting this investigation even if it wasn't a national security investigation, which it is here. So they're basically saying for all these reasons, we should win. And in fact, we think we should win on everything, but we're only asking you for now about these 100 documents. There's thousands of documents that were seized at Mar-a-Lago. We're confining what we're saying here now to the 100 documents. And what they argue, what they argue is by the logic of your own decision, you should give us what we want here because you said in your ruling, Judge Cannon, that even though you were suspending our ability to do the criminal investigation, 
you understood that it was very important that the intelligence community get the documents so that they could do their damage you said so implicitly you've already you've already made a conclusion that his whatever privilege he has it doesn't overcome every executive interest and now you have to realize that the criminal investigation cannot be disaggregated from the risk assessment that the security that the uh, intelligence community is doing because as part of that risk assessment one of the things they would do is try to track down the missing documents and try to talk to witnesses and find out how the documents were handled and where the documents might be so they would have to do the thing you've told us that we can't do in order to do the thing that you've told us we can do so what they're basically saying is number one by the by the logic of your own decision um there's no privilege here and number two even trump has undermined the privilege because remember we talked last week about the fact that the justice department gave him a grand jury subpoena in may and then that that ended up in this meeting at Mar-a-Lago on June 3rd, where Trump and his lawyers met with the Justice Department lawyer and three FBI agents, and they had given them a subpoena saying, we want everything that's more classified, and we want a, a statement from you that you've done a diligent search, and this is all there is. When they went down to Mar-a-Lago, Trump didn't say, I can't give you this these classified documents because I have executive privilege you would get my, you know, my my uh, privileged communications. He gave them the documents, so he didn't make an executive privilege claim because he knows he doesn't have one. So th basically, they say on even Trump has undermined his own claim, and on the logic of the judge's own ruling on this, you should find what we want you to do on the hundred documents. Now the point here is, if she walks back her ruling on the classified information, what that would mean is, number one, the most important thing to the government is they can they can now use the classified documents in their continuing criminal investigation, which right now they're not supposed to do. The second thing it would do, Rich, is it would take the classified element out of the special master. So that would mean you wouldn't have to get a special master with a very high security clearance, which you would need if they had to go through these documents. So that that makes the pool of potential special masters bigger, and it means they could get one in place quicker. And what the government is confident of is if the judge makes this ruling, the special master will see that Trump's uh, privilege claim, there's really not much to it. So if you have a special master in, in place and they go through all the rest of the documents, what the special master is going to see is, yeah, the government did it right. They they you know They did their privilege review correctly. So it doesn't slow up their investigation materially. They probably win in the end and they don't have to go through the delay of an appeal. So that's what they're that's what they're hoping. And I the initial signals and we now have to follow initial signals with this judge, right? Because uh she seems to follow them when she when she makes them. Uh the origin the initial signal we get out of judge uh, Con Connell uh Connell last night Cannon, I'm sorry. I don't want to why keep saying Connor. Um, the original, the initial signal we get out of Judge Cannon last night is she's going to take the government's application pretty seriously here. She told the Trump team that she expects an answer from them by Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and in the meantime, she said, when you guys are working out the special master, which they're supposed to both sides are supposed to submit something to the court on that today. Um, the judge said you should be mindful of what the government has applied for here. So, you know, it's tea leaves again. But I think that, you know, there's a very good chance that she'll give the government what they want. And I think the reason one of the, the reasons is that. I, I think she's going to see that she's apt to get reversed here and judges don't like to get reversed. Mm -hmm. If they if she makes the government do a wholesale appeal, it might be a humiliating reversal. It might be like a wholesale um, repudiation of what she's done. And in the meantime, what the government is saying is, look, if you back off the, the part of your opinion that's indefensible, then we won't appeal at all. And it'll all come out 
fine. And then she can say that she still gave Trump something because she gave him the special master and they went through the other documents. But in the meantime, she's not going to stop the the Justice Department and the FBI from doing the most important part of their investigation, which is running down the classified information. So it just seems to me it's like a sensible off ramp for her. And there might be a lot of uh, personal as well as legal reasons why she might go along with it. So, so final thing on this, and then we're going to get to uh, yet another Trump-related investigation, this one over the um, his fundraising operation. But so the, the DOJ is basically suggesting that there's still classified documents at Mar-a-Lago or missing or yeah. lost or destroyed that they're after? Yeah, they come out in the, in the filing, Rich, and they basically say, um, we have to continue this criminal investigation – and you have to take the wraps off us so that we can do this aggressively because we have reason to believe that there are still missing documents that there. Are. And uh, this goes, I think, to the report that we heard in the last several days that there were 48 envelopes for classified information that were empty in what they found. And they don't at this point understand, you know, they're, they're, obviously the intelligence community is trying to round up. Uh, what should have been in those envelopes and how many copies there were and if there's anything missing. But in the meantime, they need to track down, like, where did this stuff go? Where is it now? Uh, how come the envelopes are empty? Uh, it, did he take empty envelopes with him from Washington? Or did he have stuff in the envelopes that he took out in Mar-a-Lago and they might be someplace? Um, so the, the suggestion here is, Rich, uh, twofold. Number one, um, they're still pushing the obstruction line like, you know, there may be he may be concealing stuff that, you know, he may not be being straight with them. Uh, so there's that track. And again, you know, we haven't seen the probable cause part of the Warren affidavit. So we don't know what they represented to the court in the way of of uh, obstruction evidence. But it's clear that, uh, you know, they're basically saying that the the Trump is jerking them around about where all the stuff is. And the other thing, obviously, is we may be in a situation where they're saying the Espionage Act offenses are not in the past, that there may be ongoing mm -hmm. criminal activity. And if that's the case, if they discover that that's the case, you know, you're edging ever closer to they're going to throw up their hands and charge this guy. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's pause. Let me do a real quick plug for NR Plus digital subscription service at nationalview.com. Your way around our increasingly extensive and hardened metered paywall. I know some of you are kind of bouncing around device to device or using different browsers to try to defeat our metered paywall. That's getting harder to do. Plus, you really shouldn't be doing it uh, regardless, I mean, wh why why are you uh, ripping us off? Why, why don't you just just become an honest customer and, and pay? And it's it's not much. Uh, we have great first time deals running at any given moment. If you sign up and log into the homepage, you see many many fewer ads. Something like ninety percent fewer ads, especially the ones that are most annoying. Might be blinking uh, the side of your vision as you're trying to read an Andy McCarthy column, those go away. You can also comment on articles and blog posts, get uh, become part of the, the lively debate going on at any given moment. And also you can be part of our private Facebook group if that floats your boat and be part of exclusive calls and events with our writers, editors, and conservative newsmakers. Had a call with uh, Larry Kudlow a couple weeks ago for our subscribers. Uh, MBD, Charlie, and I did a Zoom call with about 80 NR Plus subscribers yesterday just the whole idea is to have a small group and just just have people throw out whatever they're interested in questions comments we just bat it around um so that, that's always a lot of fun so anyway lots of benefits to nr plus doesn't cost you much plus it really uh su helps support our valuable journalism so if you haven't already signed up please consider doing it um especially if you've been giving money to trump's uh uh, post-election stop the steal fundraising effort well let me let me just uh, <laughs> modestly suggest you can you can send a little money our, our way a, as well so andy we got a ongoing probe of of this one as well grand jury uh, subpoenas and subpoenas about information communications between trump um 
uh, with with Trump's post-election lawyers, some of whom are now quite infamous. So what's going on here and, and how live is this one? Well, you know, Rich, I think that it could be live, um, but we also always have to bear in mind that um, there's a political aspect to this as well. Um, I'm still not convinced that, uh, you know, the Democrats aren't trying to egg Trump into running um, and that there's that aspect of all of this, too. And the reason the reason I point this out is, you know, we're now looking at all the uh, Mar-a-Lago search stuff. And then all of a sudden there seems to be a coordinated set of uh, news reports to remind us that the January 6th investigation is still ongoing and they have various threads of it. And the thread that the media hit this week now, they could be reacting to what they've heard about, you know, grand jury subpoenas. But the thread that they decided to hit this week in the middle of the Mar-a-Lago stuff is the fundraising. And the fundraising is not new. The fundraising is a thread that the January 6th committee in the part of the investigation that was run by Zoe Lofgren, the, the congresswoman from uh, California, the Democrat, um, they had a fairly substantial presentation on this in one of the hearings where Lofgren claimed that Trump had raised $250 million uh, post-election uh, and, and suggested that a lot of it had uh, been raised on false pretenses in the sense that uh, Trump was hitting donors through their uh, electronic operation, uh, sometimes 25 fundraising appeals per day, uh, urging people to contribute. And the suggestion was that the contribute would go to something called Trump's official election defense fund. And it turns out, according to the January 6th committee, there was no uh, official election defense fund. Uh, so at least the suggestion by the committee is that this is a scam. And now it looks like the Justice Department is looking at it like it's a scam. And I'm sure the Republicans are looking at it with envy, Rich, because this this thing that Trump is, Trump establishes this pack, which is called the Save America PAC. Uh, he establishes it with the Federal Election Commission on De I'm sorry, November 9th of 2020. So in other words, right after the media uh, finally pulls the trigger and says that Biden has won the election, uh, Trump, in as part of the Stop the Steal effort, establishes this fundraising operation. And the reason it's, a, uh, I'm sure the uh, Republicans are looking at it with such envy is it's spectacular, apparently, or at least was, at raising money from from low dollar donors, uh, their operation is it, it, it's it sounds like it it successfully accomplished everything that they say Rick Scott was trying to accomplish, for example, at the uh, uh, at the Senate campaign arm, right? Although maybe the reason Rick Scott couldn't succeed is Trump had gotten all the the money and the small dollar donors by then. But in any event, they have they have a, a chest. Rich that um, dwarfs what the Republican National Committee has. They started. They were able to bring in after December. Uh, I'm sorry, November 9th, 105 million dollars, which Trump added 30 million to from his campaign war chest. So they start out with 135 million, uh, and they even now, after spending 36 million, they have 99 million dollars of cash on hand. Uh, by comparison, the media reports today say that's about that's about three times what the RNC has. They have ninety nine. The RNC's got about thirty three and a half or or so. Yeah, there, um, there, uh, there's a Republican political consultant I check in with. You know, every couple of weeks, just to take his temperature, what's going on, and almost every time we talk, it would be great if Trump spent some of that money. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, well, well, he's spending it. Uh, but he, they may not like what he's spending in, yeah, it on. Right. I mean, obviously he's sitting on a lot of it for uh, for a variety of reasons. But for example, they spent four point two million dollars, Rich, to try to defeat Brian Kemp. Now, is that a is that a Republican priority or is that a Republican priority? But that mm -hmm. was what uh, that was the, one of the biggest expenditures. But it looks like they've spent a lot of money on 
Uh, the biggest slice of money they spent was this $8.7 million that they gave to an outfit called Event Strategies. That's the group that ran the January 6th rally. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's such an immense uh, amount of money. It was, and it then, was an event as a properly named group. It was, qu it was quite the event. Yeah, it was quite the event. Uh, historic, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, they they're paying salaries of uh, of people who are working at various uh, Trump connected interests. Um, they're paying for some of the people who are caught up in this investigation. For example, according to the press reporting, Christina Bob, who is the lawyer who we've talked about, who signed that sworn declaration at Mar-a-Lago on June third. Uh, I guess she's got pretty significant legal bills. She's apparently um, uh, on the uh, whatever payroll she's on is being underwritten by this uh, PAC, according to the press reporting. Um, they've paid less money, but but still uh, an eyebrow raising amount to uh, Trump Hotel properties, which were incorporated into some of the activities that they were involved in. Uh, but what lo what it looks like, Rich, is that not a lot went to, um, you know, anything along the lines of trying to prove that there was actual election fraud, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to have been the main reason that this was uh, that this was done. And again, they're sitting on an awful lot of money, which doesn't seem to be moving in campaigns. So th this this feels to me, and, and we're going to talk to about Steve Bannon in a a minute. Uh, the Steve Bannon wall thing is just just seems just fraud. <laughs> it was just flat out fraud. But this this Trump fundraising feels more ambiguous to me because if if you're going to nail uh, him on this, it, how many political outfits engage in sort of similar quote unquote yeah. you know, false advertising? It seems inherent to the the business. Yeah, that's. I I would wonder what your. Um... What your political consultant friend uh, would say about this, because as I read these stories, I, I mean, I, you know, look, I was a prosecutor for a long time. We do a lot of fraud cases. You know, you raise money on false pretenses and then you spend it on other stuff. Uh, that's a pretty good start for a fraud case. But my sense has always been there's a lot of this kind of fugazi stuff that goes on in politics. And do, do, Democrats, I mean, I'm going to ask the same question I ask probably every other week on this podcast, which is, do Democrats really want to live in the world that they're creating? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, do Democrats want the Republicans are going to get subpoena power probably sooner rather than later? You know, do they want to be in a situation where political fundraising operations are subject to the kind of scrutiny that they're apparently going to give this. Do we want to have like January 6th committee type arrangements where it's like a one unilateral committee and they don't actually do hearings, they do propaganda television presentation? I mean, is that really what we want? And I, I, I think, unfortunately, Trump is not the only person. I'm not trying to defend Trump, but, you know, Trump is not the only person around here who's breaking norms. And I just wonder if the people who are breaking them are going to be happy to live in that world. Yeah. So speaking of breaking norms and law, we have this uh, uh, We Build the Wall fundraising effort. Bannon was indicted over his role in it, allegedly skimming about a million dollars off of this effort that raised, what, 25? Um, and right. Trump pardoned him. There are several other people involved in this scheme who were also indicted and not pardoned by Trump. And a couple of them are right. They're going to jail. Uh, one, there was a mistrial supposedly because there was a, a Trump juror who was just wasn't going to convict and he's going to be uh, retried. And then you have this prosecution of re-prosecution, well, re-indictment of, of Bannon by New York state authorities, not double jeopardy. You can explain why? But you wrote a column about this where you're like, yeah, is this, you know, this was abusive pardon, but is this really the best way to to go about it? But let me take it. I'll let you take it away. Yeah, well, I, I think that you've, you've really said it. That's what, you know, it's basically pick your poison. Do you like the corrupt pardon or the politicized prosecution? We got it all for you, you know, right. one way, one way or the other. But, you know, look, there's no defending Trump's pardon of Bannon. Um, if there were any defending it, 
he wouldn't have pardoned just Bannon. He would have pardoned the, the co-defendants as well. So this was not a careful pro, uh, executive exercise of clemency because of a, because of prosecutorial overreach. This was a favor that was done for, for a political crony. Um, I, I I have thought for a long time, Rich, that we should get rid of the pardon power. Um, I would I would uh, amend the Constitution to repeal it. I think it's a vestige of a time that doesn't exist anymore. The protections that we have in the law now for criminal defendants and making sure that there are not you know disparate treatment of similarly situated people. Uh, the levels of appellate review that you have now, the levels of internal Justice Department review. Remember, the Justice Department itself didn't even exist when you know the Constitution started and the, and the pardon power uh, originally started. So, I think the defining feature, you know, just going back, you could probably go back before before Clinton, but certainly since Clinton, the defining feature of, of the pardon process has been uh, its notorious corruption. I mean, you, I don't I can't think of any cases where, um, you know, people can look at a pardon and say, gee, you know, that really was prosecutorial overreach. I'm glad the president came in and, and uh, tempered that, especially since the Justice Department answers to the president. Right. Um, so I don't I don't think the pardon power is something that you need. And it brings a. a a disgrace to the government. I, I, I you know, I just, I, I just don't know other way, any other way to put it. Um, so you have this pardon, um, and then you have New York, where people who wield prosecutorial power in a system where you elect prosecutors and government lawyers come to office promising that they're going to use their power to go after Trump and to go after people who are aligned with Trump. Uh, which is not – it shouldn't be anybody's idea of equal protection under the law or how the criminal justice system ought to be administered. So, I mean, here you have Alvin Bragg has has uh, done this indictment of Bannon, and there's no doubt that constitutionally speaking, he can do it. Um, the pardon power, the president's pardon power affects only federal – prosecutions and federal uh, you know, trials and convictions. Uh, it has no effect on state proceedings, just like a governor can't pardon, you know, governors can pardon state prisoners and state uh, defendants. That doesn't have any impact on, on federal charges. So we have a dual sovereignty system as far as that's concerned. And Bannon has no protection under the double jeopardy clause because essentially because Trump pardoned him so early in the federal proceedings that he was never taken to trial. And generally speaking, the constitutional law says that jeopardy does not attach in a criminal prosecution until the until the jury is sworn right before the opening statements in a in a trial. That's when jeopardy attaches. So if that hasn't happened yet, you don't have any je double jeopardy claim. Uh, so he has no double jeopardy claim. And they've st they they actually in New York, where this is popular politically, they actually changed New York law to water down people's due process protections Remember in that. order to make it easier to prosecute Trump people. They did it for Manafort, uh, and you know it's now being applied to all these other Trump people. Um, they, they didn't get away with it with Manafort, by the way. His when they attempted to prosecute him, that case got thrown out. But that was because Manafort went through two full blown federal trials whereas Bannon never got anywhere near that point. So anyway, that's what you're that's what you're dealing with and here you have Alvin Bragg who won't prosecute anyone. I mean, you've got violent crime in New York that that would pop your eyes open. Uh the the major crimes in New York are up 36% at this point in the calendar over last year which was a high crime year. So the trend lines in New York are terrible, and the reason they're terrible is because of progressive prosecutors like Alvin Bragg, who have basically told people they're not going to enforce the laws. So I have to say, it's it, I find it perverse that real hardened street criminals are getting a break, and they're scorching the earth to to get these Trump guys. And it's not just Bannon; uh, it's 
you know, they, they just indicted uh, or they just uh, got a conviction of this guy, Alan uh, Weisselberg, who was Trump's uh, financial guy. Fifteen piddling little tax violations that they wouldn't prosecute against anyone else, but they went after for, with this guy. And the main reason they uh, did the deal they did with him is they're hoping to get his cooperation in the trial that they're going to have next week against the Trump next next week, next month against the uh, against the Trump real estate organization. So I, I just think, you know, is is Bannon in big trouble? Yes. It looks to me like the, the two guys that you mentioned, Rich, who pled guilty, they're going to get sentenced in December. They're looking it up to five years in jail, probably under the guidelines. Um, this guy who went to trial, he got uh, he got a hung jury, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, but if he gets convicted, you know, he almost pled guilty before he decided to go to trial. If he gets convicted, he's going to get some time. And if Bannon gets convicted in the state, he's going to be looking. I mean, the statutes will say it'll be up to over 20 years. Now, he won't get 20 years, but, you know, he'll have to do some time. Um, so, so, yes, it's a serious case. Yeah, the, the, the way I come down, at it, and this is sort of first impressions, is just um, – I don't particularly like the Weiselberg thing because it's so pretextual. It's so minor. You know, it's clearly he's Trump's accountant. You know, if you're guilty of the same thing, having worked with for anyone else, you know, for decades, obviously it wouldn't be prosecuted. And I think that's a really bad thing. Plus, as we've talked about, you know, I think we're on the same page. Uh, uh, we are largely because I'm always influenced by you on these things. But a January 6th prosecution of Trump, unless there's some evidence that we're not aware of, would be a stretch, you know, precedent breaking to uh, indict and try to prosecute a former president, et cetera. I wouldn't do it, but just ban it. It just seems so, it's such a clear, this is more like shooting someone on Fifth Avenue, obviously not a violent crime, but he just stole money from people. You know, it's horrible and just like clear cut. Um, so, so, so that's why I might not mind as, as, as much that there's a, a political motivation here because it seems a clear cut case. Yeah. I'm not, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, you know, cry crocodile tears for Steve. Um, you know, I, I, I've always had a, to the limited extent I know him, I've always had a good relationship with him personally. I've never had like a public spat with him or anything. Um, but you know, if you, if, if you, uh, you know, you, you, he's gotten himself into a lot of these jams and, you know, I, I, uh, as sympathetic as I, can try to be personally to someone, you know, you don't get to, when you get a congressional subpoena, you don't get to say, screw you. I'm not complying with the subpoena. Yeah. And if you're going to do fundraising where you're telling the public, we're going to spend every single dime on wall construction. And it turns out if it does turn out that you skimmed a million dollars off that and you used it for personal expenses, those people go to jail. I used to put them in jail myself and I didn't lose a second of sleep over it. So, you know, I mean, you 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 play near the fire. This is what happens. Yeah, well, the d different topic. But I just find it so uh, our topic for another day. So frustrating that um, you know S Steve Bannon's uh, listeners to his podcast hate. I don't know. Pick pick a name. You know that they, they hate David French more than they they uh, and they love Steve Bannon. Although all David French has done is sort of argue against various things. Where Steve Bannon has has abused the trust of, of these these people who wanted a border wall it's it's just it's so uh it's it's really bad but anyway that's a topic for another day so andy covered a lot here as usual but that's all the time we have this podcast has been produced by the incomparable sarah shitty thanks everyone for listening and thank you andy mccarthy thanks rich